you will hear a woman, Paula, phoning her friend Ralph about an application to the local council for money for their drama club. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello, Ralph. It's Paula. Hi. You know I told you we could apply to the local council for money for our drama club. I've got the application form here, but we need to get it back to them by the end of the week. I could send it on to you. You really ought to fill it in as president of the club, but I don't know if it'll get to you in time. Well, you're the secretary, so I expect it's okay if you fill it in. Yeah, but I'd really like to check it together. Right, that's fine. Night.、Like、the first part asks for the main contact person. Can I put you there? Sure. Right. So that's Ralph Pearson. Oh, and then I need your contact address. So that's two o three South Road, isn't it? No, two thirty. Oh, sorry, I always get that wrong. <laughs> then it's Drayton. Oh, do you think they need a postcode? Better put it, it's D R six eight A B. Mhm.、Mm、okay. Telephone number that's o one four five three five eight six o nine eight, isn't it? Yes. Right. Now, in the next part of the form, I have to give information about our group. So, name of group. That's easy. We're the community youth theatre group. But then I have to describe it. So, what sort of information do you think they want? Well. They need to know we're amateurs, not professional actors, and how many members we've got. What's that at present? Twenty. Eighteen. And should we put in the age range? That's thirteen to twenty-two. No, I don't think we need to. But we'd better put a bit about what we actually do. Something like members take part in drama activities. Activities and workshops. Okay. Right. That's all for that section, I think. You now have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now listen, and answer questions four to ten. Now the next bit is about the project itself, what we're applying for funding for. So first of all, they need to know how much money we want. The maximum's five hundred pounds. I think we agreed we'd ask for two fifty, didn't we? Okay. There's no point in asking for too much. We'll have less chance of getting it. Then we need to say what the project,、um, the activity is. Right. So we could write something like, to produce a short play for young children. Should we say it's interactive? Yes. Good idea. Right. I've got that. Then we have to say what we actually need the money for. Isn't that it? No. We have to give a breakdown of details. I think. Well, there's the scenery. But we're making that. We need to buy the materials, though.、Oh, okay. Then there's the costumes. Right. That's going to be at least fifty pounds. Okay. And what else? Oh, 
I just found out we have to have insurance. I don't think it'll cost much, but we need to get it organised. Yes, I'd forgotten about that. And we could be breaking the law if we don't have it. Good thing we've already got curtains in the hall. At least we don't have to worry about that. Hmm. We'll need some money for publicity. Otherwise, no one will know what we're doing. And then a bit of money for unexpected things that come up. Just put sundries at the end of the list. OK, fine. Now, the next thing they want to know is if they give us the grant, how they'll be credited. What do they mean, credited? I think they mean how we'll let the public know that they funded us. They want people to know they've supported us. It looks good for them. Hmm. Well, we could say we'd announce it at the end of the play. We could make a speech or something. Uh, they might prefer to see something in writing. We'll be giving the audience a programme, won't we? So we could put an acknowledgement in that? Yeah, that's a better idea. OK. And the last thing they want to know is if we've approached any other organisations for funding and what the outcome was. Well, only National Youth Services. And they said that at present funds were not available for arts projects. Right. I'll put that. And then I think that's it. I'll get that in the post straight away. I really hope we get the money. I think we've got a pretty good chance. Hope so, anyway. Thanks for doing all this, Paula. That's OK. See you soon. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a recorded message giving information about an animal park. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the Australian Wildlife Park Information Line. The Australian Wildlife Park is very proudly owned and operated by an Australian family, John and Amanda Brooks, who operate the Australian Wildlife Park with their children, David and Sandra. The family doesn't receive any government assistance. It's solely funded by tourists visiting the park. Thank you for your support and assistance. When the Brooks family purchased the Australian Wildlife Park in 1987, the park housed a small collection of animals and birds on a modest five acre or two hectare property. A few years later, the park doubled in size when the family purchased the adjoining property. Also, the collection of animals started to boom. In May 2003, the family designed and built a new park in the public open space, once again more than doubling in size. The park now features about 200 species with more than 2,000 head of animals, birds and reptiles. Regarding the entry fee, adults pay $23, children aged 3 to 14 pay $10, age pensioners are $17 and students are $16. One of the great things about the Australian Wildlife Park is that all of the attractions are included in the entry fee. No extra money is needed around the park, so make the most of your experience. All shows, talks, photo opportunities and animal food are included in your entry fee. In addition, the Australian Wildlife Park is open every day of the year from 9am to 5.30pm, except Christmas Day, 25th of December. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now answer questions 16 to 20. Several attractions are available to visitors to the Australian Wildlife Park. Firstly, you can meet the koalas between 10am and 4.30pm. Here, people can view the koala colony in a natural environment. Another attraction is to feed the kangaroos between 9am and 5.30pm. Visitors can take a walk through the kangaroo enclosure, viewing them in a natural environment. Kangaroo food is provided and the kangaroos are very friendly. Also enjoyable are the wombats. At 11am, 2pm and 3.45pm, there are interactive shows where the team is delighted to introduce you to these popular animals. Other attractions that may interest you are an interactive farmyard, suitable for children of all ages. Animal food is provided and the animals are very friendly. In addition, the working farm is where the country comes to town. Visitors can milk a cow, bottle feed a lamb, watch farm dogs gathering the sheep. All the excitement of a real Australian farm. When they ask for volunteers, be sure to put your hand up. Everyone can get involved. We at the Australian Wildlife Park hope all our visitors have an enjoyable time. See you soon. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk on ocean spills. As you listen to the talk, circle the appropriate letter for questions 21 to 23. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll talk about unusual ocean spills that have occurred in the world's oceans. In November of 1992, people at beaches in Canada and Alaska noticed something strange. Blue turtles, red beavers, green frogs and yellow ducks came bobbing toward them. They soon found out where the strange creatures were coming from. A ship from Hong Kong was on its way to Tacoma, Washington, when it was hit by a severe storm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. During the storm, huge waves washed 12 containers overboard. Inside the containers were 29,000 plastic bath toys. One of the containers opened and thousands of plastic bath toys spilled out and began to float across the Pacific Ocean. Ten months later, the first yellow ducks arrived on the North American shore. Beachcombers along the shore began to find the toys and reported them to local newspapers. But the people who were most excited by the plastic toys were the oceanographers. It gave them an opportunity to study ocean currents and winds. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30.
Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Oceanographers drop bottles into the ocean to study these things, but it would be too expensive to drop twenty-nine thousand bottles into the ocean at once. Imagine the value of studying the plastic ducks and frogs. This gave some interesting information to the oceanographers. The first toys were picked up in Sitka, Alaska, ten months after they were washed off the ship. Some headed back into the North Pacific, while others drifted around the Arctic Ocean and headed for the North Atlantic. Many of the toys were swept northeast by the wind and were frozen in the ice of the Bering Sea. They're expected to cross the North Pole and float on down to the British Isles. This reminds me of another unusual ocean spill. In 1990, a ship traveling to the west coast of the United States from Korea was caught in a severe storm. The waves swept 21 containers of Nike shoes into the water. Scientists estimate that about 80,000 running, jogging, and hiking shoes, 40,000 pairs of shoes to you and me, hit the water at once. The shoes were for men, women, and children. About six months later, people at beaches from Oregon to British Columbia began to find running shoes washed ashore. By the end of the year, Washington newspapers reported people finding hundreds of shoes. In Seattle, thousands of shoes floated to shore. Since the shoes were not attached, they arrived one at a time. The shoes were dirty, but after they were washed, they were still in good condition. People set up exchanges to find matches for their shoes. Oceanographers studied the information to learn more about the ocean. Some Nike shoes reached Hawaii. Others went to the Philippines and Japan. According to the scientists, some of the shoes are on a trip around the world and should end up back in Washington and Oregon. Can you believe it? Many pairs of running shoes, as well as plastic ducks and frogs, are still on their ocean journey. So, if you go to a beach anywhere in the world, don't be surprised if you see a green plastic frog or a woman's size seven jogging shoe bobbing toward you. So, keep your eyes out, so you may find free bath toys and even a new pair of shoes. Thank you for attending my lecture. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a conversation between two students about studying abroad. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hey, Mary, how's school going? Haven't seen you in a while. What have you been up to? John, good to see you again. I've been really busy the last couple of weeks. I'm applying to study abroad next year. Really? So am I. I think it will be a great experience to be able to study in another country. 
What country do you want to go to? At first I wanted to study in Africa, but my parents really don't want me to go there because they think it will be dangerous. So now I'm thinking about going to Spain, Italy or Japan. Actually, I think Africa would be a fascinating place. I would want to go there to visit. Maybe not to study, but definitely I would want to go visit. For next year, I want to go to either China or Germany to study. But my parents can't afford any European countries. So maybe... Why China or Germany? Well, I want to go to China because I think it's a really interesting country with a long history. Plus, it has been changing so much, and I think it is a great time to be there. I really want to improve my Chinese also, and I've been taking Mandarin courses the last two semesters. I would want to go to Germany because my mother is German, and I want to learn more about my cultural background. How about you? Why the countries you chose? Well, I want to go to a Spanish-speaking country. I took Spanish in high school, so I figure if I go to a Spanish-speaking country, I'll be better off knowing some of the language already. But I have already been to Mexico many times, and South American countries don't have classes for my major, except for Brazil, but they mostly speak Portuguese there. I would want to go to Italy because I want to do a study about ancient Roman civilization. It has always been a dream of mine to go and see Pompeii and the volcanic ruins. Plus, my family has Italian roots and I love Italian food. I want to go to Japan mainly because my girlfriend was born in Japan and always tells me all of these fascinating stories about Japanese history and culture. I am a big fan of sumo wrestling also. So I've always wanted to see a sumo match in person. I really love sushi and almost all Japanese food. Recently, I have started to watch some Japanese baseball too. But of course, these are all secondary reasons. My main reason is of course my girlfriend and understanding her culture. I don't speak any Japanese though, so that is my major drawback. I think it is much better to go to a country if you can speak the language. That's great. When do you have to decide by? I have to finish all my applications this week. I'm really stressed trying to finish everything, on top of all my schoolwork. I'm almost done with my applications. I just have to finish the Italy application. I think my last choice is Italy, so I'm doing that one last. How long do you want to go for? I think I'm only going to go abroad for one semester, or else I won't be able to graduate on time. I have many classes left until I can finish my degree, and I'm not sure if I will be able to take them studying out of the country. I think I might be able to study in Spain because my Spanish is fluent, but definitely not in Italy or Japan, unless they have classes offered in English. I want to go for a year. I've heard that it's better to go for a year because you get a fuller experience and get a better grasp on the language. But I understand that most people can't finish their degree in time. It was hard trying to decide which country I would rather go to, but I think my first choice is to go to China. I know Germany will be great also. Either way, I will be thrilled to have the opportunity to study there. What's your first choice? I really don't have one. Actually, I think I'm like you. Just being able to study in another country will be great. Either Japan or Spain will be awesome. Italy will be awesome too. But I've been there a bunch of times, so I think I prefer to go somewhere else. Sounds exciting. We'll have to go to class now. It was great talking to you again. See you around next time? Yeah, sure. See you around. Hope that everything goes well. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Welcome to our channel. Today in this video, I will discuss with you writing task 2 and the question for today is Today family members eat fewer meals together. Why is this? Is this a positive or negative trend? So the question is 
nowadays family members eat less meals together like they hardly you know eat meals together uh, why is this why is this happening and is this a positive or negative friend so let's start with the body paragraph 1 there is no ounce of doubt means uh, there is no doubt that nowadays families hardly have time to eat together due to stressful workloads and technological innovations so why is this case so this case is because of stressful workloads and technological innovations undeniably it is a negative trend as it weakens the bond because the members less communicate with each other and rarely engage in healthy discussions so it is weakening the family bond that's why i believe it's a negative trend because there are less there are less communication because of this and they hardly engage in healthy discussions in today's world every member of the family needs to work to survive right and they may have scheduling conflicts resulting in insufficient time to eat as a family so because of different schedules uh they might have less time to eat as a family in many developed countries for example one parent works the morning shift works in the morning shift while the other gets the night shift so one member is working in the morning and another in the night shift so leaving them with little time to spend together and eat as a eat at the same table so they will hardly or barely have the time to eat or share the meal together another factor could be technological advancements as most teenagers prefer to eat in front of the tv or with their phones and sit alone in other rooms to watch tv while eating so nowadays what is happening people prefer eating meals in front of the televisions or while you know using their mobile phone so they sit alone in the other rooms not in the dining table so they do not share the meal with the family however not sharing meals with family has significant negative consequences means negative outcomes making it a negative trend to begin with one of the most important factors of less communication is that family members do not share meals so they do not share food so this is one of the important factor behind less communication in the uh, family to be more specific or to be more precise in the past family member would discuss their entire day's activities troubles and many other things around the dinner table but as people no longer have time to do so communication gaps have grown so undeniably in the past what would happen that people used to you know sit together and enjoy their meal and discuss their entire day's activities their troubles their problems with each other and because of this they they have a healthy uh, discussions they have a healthy communication with each other but nowadays what is happening they do not have enough time or uh, and many other things around them but nowadays they do not have enough time uh, people no longer have the time to do so so communication gaps have grown furthermore reduced time with one's family can lead to psychological problems such as uh sorry furthermore reduced time with one's family can lead to psychological problems so it could also lead to uh, psychological issues as a person must feel loved by family members to maximize healthy growth family meals are one way to achieve this overwhelming sense of comfort so that love which um, you know member needs from the family maximize the healthy growth but if you know the parents will not share the meal with the child or the child will not share the meal with the parents so that you know sense of love or comfort will be uh, will not be there so psychological factor could also be a negative trend right to conclude it is obvious that the major reasons behind the decline in the frequency of family meals are lack of time and technological advancements and one can say this is a negative trend so it is obvious means it is clear that the major reasons behind this is this issue is a lack of time and technological advancements and this is a negative trend as it is 
weakening the bond or you know creating the communication gaps between the family members and also creating psychological issues so this was for today if you like the video do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel i'll meet in the next video till then bye bye and take care